Hello, I'm Ian Dolphin, Executive Director of the Aperio Foundation, and welcome to today's Aperio webinar on sharing best practice with Git and GitHub. Uh, if you don't know, Aperio is a non-profit membership organization of higher education institutions and commercial partners worldwide. Uh, we work closely with our sister organization in France, the ASAP Portail Consortium, and our collective membership is around 160 institutions and other organizations. Aperio currently provides an umbrella for 16 software communities or projects. The software these communities produce focuses on supporting the academic mission and includes Sakai, Opencast, Xerti, UPortal, CAS, and more. Check out www.aperio.org for more details. We're always keen to provide opportunities for projects to share their practice with common infrastructure. And we've recently had several requests from our incubating projects for more information on the use of Git and GitHub, the topic of today's webinar. Just a couple of notes before we start. We're going to be recording this webinar and adding it to the Aperio YouTube channel. And I'd encourage you, those of you who are accessing via a web browser, to post questions in the big blue button chat. I'm going to try and catch those as we go along and use them as a start for the discussion after the introductions. So, uh, without further introduction, I'll hand you over to Ms. Agmoyed, Chair of the CAS Project Management Committee and Unicon, and Matthew Bucket of the Sakai Project Management Committee and the University of Oxford. Uh, and thanks again to both of you for presenting this afternoon. Take it away. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, Ian, and welcome everybody to this session about um, Git and GitHub. Um, so Matthew and I are going to talk to you about some of the best practices, uh, recommendations, and ideas that we've uh, sort of learned and gathered uh, as they relate to general uh, Git discipline and things that you can do to make your life easier with Git. And then we'll certainly move on to things that you can do with GitHub uh, in terms of managing a project, governing it, and just um, you know overall suggestions and ideas that would make your life easier um, uh, with GitHub-based projects, and both CAS and Sakai certainly are uh, taking advantage of uh, GitHub services, obviously. Um, so I'll begin with uh, a number of Git best practices that we found to be extremely useful uh, when, uh, when working on CAS and, and I, I, I suppose Sakai as well. And that is that, first and foremost, it is extremely helpful to designate topic branches uh, uh, for for contributions, um, oftentimes you have a you have a rather large code base. For instance, as the CAS project is, and you'll have many contributors who want to you know work on this issue or that feature and so on. And it's always very helpful to advertise and broadcast that um, you know for every feature, every change, every bug fix, anything that you want to work on as contributors, it's very helpful to start off with the topic branch from the master branch or whatever the current in development branch might be. Start from there and you know, isolate your changes from the rest of the world, continue working on that branch, keep committing, keep making changes and so on. And then when you're ready, attempt to submit a pull request, a patch, a contribution notification back to the project's appropriate branch and select your target destination. This makes it easy for folks to keep up to date with the development that goes on in the project if they need to resync, and it makes it a whole lot, a whole lot easier for them to isolate changes and not overstep boundaries and not have to do very dangerous and sometimes ugly things like rebasing and resolving merge conflicts and so on and so forth, which is actually something we, we, we really do want to avoid. Rebasing, resolving those conflicts is something that is very non-trivial for folks to learn and is, is, is just a, a, a non-pleasant operation, I guess, uh, to begin with anyway. Um, so moving on, it's also important that you keep the repository size that your project deals with down to a minimum, as, as small as possible. Um, CAS is actually guilty in this case because, um, you know, if you look at the repository size, the clone size is very, very large. Um, so it makes it easy, it makes it more difficult for people to download the project, start contributing to it, maybe even building it, making sense about it. 
and so on and so forth. And so it, it's, it's, it's helpful that you follow practices that allow you to shrink the size of that repository. And there are certainly practices that we have followed at times to make sure that the repository size uh, is, is as bare as, as possible. Um, I'll hand it over to Matthew to make a few extra comments here. Yeah, so in Sakai, we have a migration going from a previous um, version control system and at that point it's a good when you can try and reduce your repository size as you can try and strip out um, old um, branches and old bits of history that are no longer relevant. Another thing that we found trying to um, keep your repository size small is although nowadays most people will use sort of dependency management tools that download um, artifacts when they're needed, that hasn't always been true in the past. And so when we did our conversion or to, to Git effectively, we tried to remove any large files that, was, that sort of were in our project history that were no longer currently needed so that they wouldn't be fully imported into Git and as Ms. Hood said, increase the repository sizes. It does cause problems. Um, so yeah, I'll hand back to Ms. Hood. Sorry. Sorry, I'll hand back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I had to remember to unmute myself. Okay, excellent. So uh, moving on, one other important thing that, that I found, and I maybe Sakai as, as well, is the designation of specific branches that target releases of the software. So if you're working on a project, it is extremely helpful to say, you know, we have a 1.0 release. We're going to have a designate, designated branch for that. We're going to have a 1.1 release, another branch for that, a 2.0, a 2.1, and so on and so forth. And we typically keep these branches um, for major or minor releases of the software. So a 1.0 has its own branch, a 1.1 has its own branch, and changes then get isolated uh, into these specific branches and make it easy for others to know that this branch targets this particular milestone of, of the release, and this one does that, and so on and so forth. This um, is not without complication because sometimes you'll find that you know you have a branch that deals with a minor release of the software let's say 2.5 and you know at the same time you are you're also working on a 2.6 or a 3.0 for instance for that matter and there are specific branches for those as bugs are found as defects are found or as you are working on particular features and so on there are cases sometimes where you need to to, to uh, you know transfer changes from one branch to the other you know in 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 tech terms you know you want to backport it or um port it forward from a branch you're working on to to the next release of the software in its own branch or vice versa and this, the, these will take time, these will take skill, and then you have to sort of teach your contributors to say, you know, you're working on this particular bug release, uh, bug, bug fix, this needs to really be targeted to this branch, but not to this other branch. Or, you know, if you want to apply this change to this branch, you're welcome to do so, we'll then backport it or port it forward to the appropriate release that everybody else might actually be using and may want to, may want to utilize. Um, so they make it, you know, pros and cons for this approach in particular. But in the CAS, CAS case specifically, we found that this makes things a whole lot easier and that it, it provides clarity so that people can see what is targeted for what. And in many ways, it sort of helps as we talk later on with your project's overall release policy. Because sometimes you can then say, you know, according to our release policy and our release schedules, we're not really working on this particular version anymore. We're not going to backport changes or bug fixes. Everybody's going to go into that one. And separation of concerns as far as releases go um, make, make that a whole lot more uh, clear. Um, avoiding submodules and preserving value in version control history. I think Matthew has a few comments on this, but I totally agree um, uh, on the submodules part. 
Um, a lot of projects tend to, uh, as I've witnessed but have not yet done myself or um, have had that much practical experience with, a lot of folks tend to break up the project into separate repositories, if you like. And, and um, you know, in, in the master project, they specifically designate modules or directories, if you like, in, in, in more common terms, that then point to those other repositories. So you have this conglomerate of, let's say, 20 repositories that they're all pulled together by this one big repository. Some folks tend to think, that this approach makes it easier to release, it makes it easier to, to manage, it keeps the repository size down maybe. I could not disagree more. I think this, this makes it very, very confusing. Um, and uh, managing 10 repositories or more is certainly a lot more challenging than managing one. And um, you know there are certainly other practices or other techniques that you can use uh, to keep the repository size down and make sure that things are organized better. On top of the fact that for your contributors, again, it's a whole lot simpler to deal with one thing than it is for them to, to, to learn that, oh, I'm working on this feature. This one's actually in this other repository over here. I cloned the wrong thing. And imagine all the documentation and the teaching and the instructions you have to provide to, to, to folks to learn how all of that process works and it's just not sustainable. Matthew, any yeah. comments on, on these two? I think I'm fully with that. Um, in to me, breaking things up does increase modularity, but it's just so much simpler to just not use submodules. Um, one additional complication is that if you're coming from another version control system like SVN, you may have used something like called SVN externals, which is similar in sort of concept. It allows you to break up your repository into smaller repositories. But there's a fundamental difference in how Git does submodules to how SVN externals work in that in um, SVN, when you create a commit in a new submod, in a new external, um, it automatically gets pulled in to the sort of master project. So you can commit to one of your sort of sub repositories and have it automatically appear. In the Git submodule world, this doesn't happen. So you end up creating a commit in your sort of sub project and then creating another commit in your master project to point your master project at the newer version of the sub project. And especially if people are just getting started with Git, it is very confusing and can break lots of other workflows that people are using. So unless you there's, for a project's own files, there really is no good reason to use submodules, in my opinion. The only case where it can be useful is if you have an external project that um, you have to pull in in source form, and you're not in control of that project at all. You're not really you contributing to that project and making commits against it. You just want a snapshot of it at a particular revision as pulled in and you want to keep some history rather than taking a sort of raw copy of it and in that case there is a you can use submodules for that but it still complicates everybody's workflow because every user of your repository will then have to set up the submodules when they first get your repository so even for that case it's really not all that advisable okay that's the uh, shall I, i'll carry on to the preserving value in um uh, version control. So one, one thing that I think pe lots of users of version control systems try to do is they try to make the version control system provide value to its users. Um, so as, as well as just helping collaborate on a, a project and providing the technical infrastructure to do that so that you can sort of share your um, files amongst multiple developers and help them edit them at the same time. Um, if you're using Git, it's advisable to try and um, keep as much value in the, re the repository as possible. Um, what I mean by keep the value is that to make your history that's kept in the repository useful and helpful for people so that there's um, when other people come to work on the project, they can understand why changes were made and what what a change was. Um, so when I say what, what files were affected by a particular change and 
how that has evolved the product. Um, so that rather than, so take an example is something like, it's common, common for programmers to start on a new project and go, oh, I don't like the indentation on this file. I want to reformat it with my editor and format it how I like. And then they commit a patch back to a project with some a bug fix in it, but it also has their change in indentation. And so when somebody else comes to look at that file um, a year later, everything in that file looks to be related to this one bug fix. And so it becomes very difficult to work out what was actually changed to fix that bug and to understand what the, co the underlying cause of the bug was. So if you're using a version control system, and get, it's not necessarily specific to Git. It's, it's trying to preserve value so that when somebody makes a change and when you have commits in your history, they're good commits and they help people understand the repository more. OK, do you have anything to say on that, Ms. No, I'm all good. Thanks very much. Let's move on. OK. Okay, very good. So we're we're gonna next talk about some practices that that, that we find GitHub projects uh, can take advantage of to make their lives a whole lot easier. And these are things that not only contribute to the health of the project, but from a marketing perspective, from an advertisement perspective, from everybody come get to know us uh, and and figure out things about the project. These things are, are tremendously helpful. And as we, as we talk later on, they make it also easier for contributors to, to get started with the project and not be confused so as to find where things are. And, and the very first ones, perhaps very obvious obvious ones, are that GitHub has this, has this great ability um, um, to, to, to centralize the place to track issues as well as patches and contributions and in their vernacular pull requests. So imagine if you're a contributor and if you're coming across uh, a, a given project, let's say on GitHub, it's a lot easier to, to take advantage of what you already know. If you're a GitHub user, you already know how to use issues. You, you already understand where the pull requests are. You already know how these issues are processed, um, You know if they're tagged to a particular release, if they carry any extra metadata as part of labels and so on. Native features that the platform offers, these certainly go without saying that they make it a whole lot easier. And um, in certain respects, it's easier for one system to rule them all, basically. Uh, where you have the code in one place and the issues right next to it in the same system, and the same um, um, you know system manages pull requests and contributions, and potentially if you can manage it ideally, it also manages the documentation and everything else that goes along with it. So it all really can get handled if you're a contributor in one single transaction where code is updated, documentation is updated, issues are updated immediately and then closed automatically and various other things are triggered as, as a result of that whole transaction. Now there are some, um, sorry Matthew, did you want to say, say anything here? Yeah, I, just one quick thing on the sort of issues and pull requests. Um, I think if you use GitHub for this, you just you can do it outside of GitHub, but you get a lot for free without very much extra work. So you don't have to spend time when you could be improving your product um, worrying about integrating another system. So for example, our example is in the Sakai community, we actually use Jira for our issue tracking. But that has, although it's it is a more complex and fully featured product than GitHub issues. People in the Sakai community have to have spent time maintaining our Jira setup and maintaining the integration that we have with GitHub. And at the moment, it's it's seen as good value. I mean, we do get more out of it, but it does take away time from doing other things. So it, it's a sort of a trade-off in that part. So, but for starting out, I would definitely recommend going just pure GitHub route. And it also has very nice integration points. Um, GitHub itself, so that you can say when you do things like um, merge a commit that it will link it up with the appropriate issue automatically as long as you format your commits correctly. Um, and it leads to a very, it, it again puts more value into um, 
your source code. So if you've got a, a commit comment that references an issue, it will link to that issue right in the web UI. And so it makes for new people who are trying to explore changes, um, it makes it less work for them to find out what's going on. Very good. Um... So yeah, I totally agree. One thing that you you know while you were talking, I, I remembered this that cross referencing issues um, also works across different projects on GitHub. You're not limited to just your own your own repository, which is great for social purposes, right? Imagine that you're working on a project and you have a dependency on this other thing, and that other thing is also a project on GitHub. And you know you discover an issue, so you go over to them, you file an issue, and say, "Hey, imagine you know I'm I'm working on project X. We utilize your services. Here is an issue to our project that describes this. Let's link it all together." And it's great for discovery purposes. You know, people that also share the same number of dependencies and frameworks kind of run into these historical links. And they go, oh, maybe I should go over there to figure out exactly what this project is all about. How come they use this one? And maybe I should get to learn that a little bit more. So that also helps attract people to, to the project that you work on and vice versa. Um, so the, 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 the three bullet points on this slide that talk about continuous integration and building uh, in managing snapshot releases and even even documentation to some degree really are all interconnected which is that when you when you're a project on github there are a number of native built-in services you can you can immediately take advantage of that are very much free um, and allow you to provide continuous builds something like Travis CIs or I believe Jenkins and various other build tools are available that you can integrate very very easily at the click of a button really uh, with your project so that you can have the various branches of your, your repository built automatically per every change even on scheduled dates pull requests that people contribute can also get built automatically. You can automate, I don't know, code scans and analyses and various other types of status checks to make sure you can preserve quality automatically as opposed to doing manual work. The goal of doing continuous build and have it automatically publish snapshot releases and maybe even automatically update the, next, update the documentation with various changes people have done or produce technical documentation like Java docs or if it's a JavaScript project, you know, it's equivalent, and so on and so forth. It all really comes down to one thing, that is that you want to automate everything so you do less work. These things exist so you don't have to, as Andrew, as Matthew mentioned, spend time linking various disparate systems together. It's all in one place. All you have to do is click on the right buttons, and you get it all working for free immediately, and then you automate it, which is great. Not only for you, again, I emphasize, but for your contributors, because when somebody comes in and says, here's my patch and I fixed bug number 54, you don't have to worry about, oh, does this, does this adhere to our you know, styling guidelines? Does it break master? Does it do all tests successfully pass? No, you don't worry about that. You just wait for the check mark to go green because there is an automated process in the background that automatically began to build that entire patch, that entire change set. And if it fails, then the contributor can, can, can sort of be notified and make changes appropriately until it turns green. And there's very little work that you have to do. So the goal really is to automate, 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 automate. And these, these built-in um, platform features make it very easy to do so. Yeah, we, we've had great success with having Travis build our both main branches and our pull requests. It also stops the situation where people go, well, it works for me. Effectively, your continuous build server becomes the sort of source of truth. And if it works on the CI server, then it should work. And you don't get into this, oh, maybe you've got slightly different config, maybe your environment set up differently. You sort of have this one place where everything gets tested in exactly the same setup, um, which has been very valuable for us. Um, We've also we also use Jenkins in the Sakai project for our nightly builds, but they're slightly different. So those those are builds that people can actually use in for testing and QA purposes. So that's how we sort of divvy up the two 
the two areas. One, one, one comment I like to make about documentation and readme's is that you know there are a number of formats available for for any given project um, to produce documentation, readme's, various guides, and so on. Um, Markdown certainly seems to be all the rage these days, and some folks even like ASCII doc to better. Um, you know, out of those two, I recommend any of them. Do what makes sense for you. Uh, but what's what's really above all else more important is that, especially the README uh, is relevant for what I'm about to say, which is that people generally, when they browse onto your project, when they find it in their search results, when you know Google pops up a link to your project, and when they get to your repository, on average, they may spend about 10 to 15 seconds looking over, looking over the files and looking over the general outline of your repository to see if it's worth their time, whether it attracts them, whether they find it interesting, whether there's enough information for them to get going with it. And readmes do magic. I cannot emphasize this more. Readmes are magic. You know, you have somebody effectively for maybe 15 seconds, and you have 15 seconds to do an elevator pitch in a readme. So if your README is not existent, if it's messy, if it doesn't have the right information, if it doesn't have any links, if it doesn't quite convey the information for folks to get started with the project, then you are really not doing anybody uh, any favors. Um, uh, 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 and, and non-existent README in, in many ways is better than a terrible README because somebody will be immediately put off. So pay very, very special attention to your README. Do not clutter it with a whole lot of information. It's not a place for documentation. But at the same time, it's, it's very helpful to provide enough links and, and references and maybe even imagery and so on uh, that would make it, make it more attractive for a newcomer, especially, to discover the project and, and move on with it. Just wanted to give you a time check, guys. We're about 30 minutes in, so about 15 minutes to run to allow some questions. Thanks. Sure. Thanks again. Okay. So Matthew, any any additional comments on this slide before we move on? Mm -hmm. You know, so that one quick thing is um, if you create a contributing.md file, um, that file gets linked to when people are creating a pull request, so when they're attempting to make a contribution to your repository, and it's a way to point them off that sort of best practice for your repository and. Um, your workflow for how you're going to use the issues and what they can expect of you. So it's just one, one thing to point out. Um, and the other thing, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just one thing is, um, th the thing about GitHub is people, some people use it as sort of like a, um, not like a CV, but um, a sort of portfolio of stuff that they've been involved with. So try and encourage that sort of behavior to try and sort of big up your contributors to try and get them more involved in the project. And it's just be aware that that's how some people see the project or their contributions to your project. So yeah, carry on. Back over to you. How about you, how about you carry on on the slide too? I've talked long enough for now. Okay, <laughs> so, so one thing that um, typically projects have to deal with is security issues. And in a typical GitHub project, everything is public. So if somebody creates an issue um, against your project, everybody will be able to see it, and there's no way to sort of lock it down. You can get it deleted, but it's got out there. So it's good if you're a new project to have a, um, first of all, a document about how you're going to manage security issues. Um, but if you're wanting to provide um, sort of code support for security issues. Um, in the Sakai community, we've ended up having a fork on GitLab, which is another Git hosting um, service that does allow private repositories. And so we end up with um, pull requests in the GitLab um, repository that allows people to review the security issues there if they want to, and then merge them in, and then push them back across to our main GitHub repository. And so it allows a similar workflow, but in, in private without anybody being able to see the issue before you want to formally announce your sort of security advisory. Um, another thing to be aware of is some people may have long-lived forks. Um, so, 
uh, a product like Sakai has had um, sort of local deployments, and a common way to manage those is to fork uh, a, the GitHub project and then to start making changes in your fork of the GitHub project. So you, you effectively create a local fork for your deployment and then make some changes into that fork um, to sort of, maybe it's to reskin your particular instance or to change some particular um, config that you can't change through a configuration setting or something like that. Or it may be that you want to implement a new feature in your local fork. Um, just be aware of um, that people might be having um, long-lived local forks and Git does or GitHub doesn't work very well with long of local forks in that by default you can't it tries to make everybody contribute everything back to the central repository um, so it can cause problems where issues end up in the central repository rather than in people's local fork um, GitHub support have been very good about this the fact they can break a fork repository so that this doesn't happen but then you don't you, you don't see as much of the um, network happening in your GitHub pages because all of the forks have been broken off. Um, keep your repository tidy. So if you're going to try and encourage people to contribute to your repository, try and keep um, things like the branch names, which is something that everybody will see, um, or unlimited. If somebody checks out your repository and finds 40, 40 branches in there, it's often it can be confusing. If you just have two, for example, like master and stable, it's much clearer about what the, the purpose of those two branches are, and there'll just be less confusion. Um, and if you're thinking about going to using GitHub, but you have some people who are, who are very adverse to it, um, you can always allow people to get copies of the code from GitHub using SVN. So GitHub supports um, SVN access to the same repository. It doesn't allow all of the features that you have when you're accessing through Git, but it, it can be a way to allow people to contribute and still access the code without having to update some of their workflows to Git. Although I would encourage you to try and get everybody to use Git. It, it provides a sort of escape hatch if you have people who are dedicated to SVN in the, in the background. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to um, project governance and contributor guidelines and topics of, of, of this nature and things that you can do to help your your your, your project community really flourish and, and, and enjoy contributing to the project. Really, that's this is this is this is key that it's going to have to be um, a joyful, joyful thing for people to do this. And these are things that, that we think um, are going to help with that aspect. So first of, and, and probably the most obvious is that a common toolkit definitely helps. You know, if, if your project is building its source code with three different tools, it's a massive problem. You know, if you have different development environments, that's a slightly less complicated problem but nonetheless it is it is a difficult thing to manage because some people like i don't know php storm a bunch of other folks like i don't know this and that and these various development environments make it difficult for people to to get set up uh to get started get building and then get contributing uh so if you find one consistent process across the board and make sure that there's enough instruction and adequate description of what what one might have to do to set up all of that. Um, then that that would that would make it a whole lot simpler because then you really have to just again manage one thing. It's consistent across everybody's environments, every developer, every committer, every contributor, and you don't really have to you know spend time fighting issues that otherwise uh, would be would be pointless. So that's, that's important. And again, you want to make sure that this process is, is, is documented, that you know, you know, if somebody wanted to say, how do I, you know, how do I set up a development environment and start contributing? You have a document, you have a process, you, you explain to them, this is how we start tracking issues. This is how we do pull requests. This is how you build it. This is the types of tests that you run. You've got, I don't know, various conventions and guidelines and, and style checks and so on. 
and, and that process needs to be followed by everybody, no exceptions, everybody. Uh, no exceptions, I keep repeating this, no exceptions. Um, and and that's, that's, that really contributes to your, to your project success. But at the same time, um, it's important, very important to put people before code. Uh, you know, you want to certainly encourage good behavior and praise good actors, people that follow the process, that do good work, and you know, have spent the time and sometimes even the money um, to, to put together a patch, to fix a typo, to provide a bug fix, so on and so on and so on. And you know, you over time you get to learn the members of your of your community, and you realize if this particular person has not followed the process, if they have not provided enough information when they filed this issue, if their patch is missing this test and that that bit and so on, you can certainly help them, advise them, get them going with the process, get them on the right track, and and help them get better as they move on. Psychologically, I'm inclined to think that everybody wants to do good. And you know, every once in a while, you may run into a few bad actors who just are, are ignorant of, of how everybody works in that community together. But overall, if you provide enough instruction and, and help people with a friendly manner and understand their contribution and the fact that they have, they're providing you with free lunch, uh, essentially, um, eventually they'll get better and they'll enjoy it and they'll continue to do so if if your demeanor and your attitude towards their contribution is friendly and positive. Um, Matthew, any comments? No, I was just going to, one thing I was going to say is that um, contributing isn't just necessarily sort of making patches. Um, you can be a contributor to a project by doing things like reviewing other people's contributions. Now, Normally, that's something that the maintainers of the project take on, but it doesn't have to be. Um, if, you're, if you're someone who goes in and checks that they've followed some guidelines or that what they're doing is sensible, um, that's a good way to contribute to the project. And I think it's, um, it's good to try and encourage that sort of behavior. Do you know I mean, to, to try and say it's not just the, ma the maintainers who are responsible for reviewing pull requests, checking that issues are sensible, that they're not a duplicate of an existing issue. It's something that everyone in the community can take part in and, and you become more of a, a sort of um, a more central member of the community as you perform that, that you're um, getting to know the people who are doing, creating issues and what sort of areas they're working in. And you can therefore become more involved in the community and progress through it. And along with that, I think it's important to praise good practices. Often, when you're getting contributions from people, um, all too easy to say, "Okay, yeah, we've merged it and stop there." And I think it's good if you see somebody sort of creating a, for example, a good commit message when you, you've had lots of semi okay ones it's they are great thanks for the really helpful description and the commit message that explains this really well um, to sort of encourage good practice from people not necessarily to be the, the person sort of going out there saying oh you've you've got a terribly short commit message that doesn't explain it at all but to try and sort of more carrot um, people in the right direction to um, be behave in a, a good and constructive manner Great, thanks. Um, so as, as a, continuation, a continuation of Matthew's point, really the overall goal of this presentation really and, and things that, that, that you know, we covered with you is to make sure that you have a vibrant, active community who takes part in reviewing potentially all aspects of that project's development and um, sustenance. Uh, your goal is to, to advertise, attract contributors, and do everything in your power possible to, to make that number just boom. And um, you know, along with the best practices and things that you can do on a technical perspective and various other things you can do from a project perspective, it's important to realize that, again, much to Matthew's um, point, 
everybody shares the responsibility of making this project succeed. Not just the developers, not people who have access to, you know, make commit changes directly and committers and so on. Everybody, regardless of their level of skill and involvement, whether they just deploy it, write documentation, answer questions, um, you know, write code, test things, deploy things, whatever it is. It's everybody's responsibility. This is a community. Everybody sort of shares the same rights and in some ways even the same set of responsibilities. So you want to encourage this sort of behavior that, yes, you want to get involved. Please submit issues. Please submit pull requests. This is a problem that we all want to fix, not please report it and I will get to it as soon as possible. No, we want to work together as, as a community. We want to make sure these contributions are made easy, that, you're, that you feel welcome, that you feel friendly. Uh, towards the project members so that you're not embarrassed or ashamed or scared or whatever it is. Um, you know, if, if you make a mistake or submit the wrong thing and so on and so forth. These are these are things that you want to promote as, as your project um, um, grows larger. One thing that I found very, very helpful, and there are numerous talks about this particular aspect of managing a project on YouTube and various other conferences I've, I've attended I've, and I've, I've heard other people talk about, is the merging policy. Um, some folks often talk about that it's difficult to say no to people and you know we're not gonna accept your contribution from it for this and that reasons. And some people have the exact opposite. Here's what I think personally would work and this is the approach that the CAS project also attempts to adopt, which is that in general, we accept all contributions and I think you should too. Especially, or I should say, even if they're bad ones, even if they're terrible ones, even if they're, you know, somebody's done 80% of the work, but the other 20% is missing, that's perfectly fine. You can say, well, thank you very much. You've done 80%. We'll do the other 20%. Or would you like to do the other 20% too? Do you have time? Are you capable? Or, you know, are you, can you manage that? No. Well, thank you very much. We do the other 20%. Merge as quickly as possible. Merge everything as possible. Like I, like I said, most people tend to do good. Nobody shows up with a patch or a pull request or some sort of contribution that intends to delete half the code base. That just does not happen. Most folks want to improve things. And so if you show that you can accept contributions, that you can get to them quickly, you know, if, if somebody pulls, uh, puts, puts out a, a, a patch to your project, and you say, well, thank you very much. We have our you know, quarterly review meeting coming up next Friday. We'll get to it. You're number 54 in the list. Well, then they immediately go away. That's not really worth anybody's time. But if you can get to it and quickly and say, well, thank you very much. This is excellent. You know, um, you know it may, may need a little bit of work, but we're going to merge this immediately within the next five minutes. Thanks very much. There's going to be some follow-up work. Please follow up and do another pull request. And then another one after that, another one after that which makes it easier, this particular kind of pace, that you end up releasing changes too quickly and, and too often because you want folks to take advantage of these features quickly and then find maybe issues or further enhancements on them and then do another contribution, which then allows you to release that one quickly and you just keep doing this at a, at a reasonable pace and, and somewhat rapid pace. And you have this outline timetable that says, hey, we do releases every two weeks or every three weeks or so on. And this timetable encourages people to say, hey, I have five things I want to get done. I know the release date is coming up this Friday. I better go work on those five, see how much I can get done. But hey, if I forgot some of them, if I missed some of them, that's not, that's not a problem. These folks you know, tend to merge changes quickly and they're, 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 they're at it. So another another release date is coming up two weeks after that. And I'm not I don't have really have to wait six months to a year or two years, whatever, for somebody to come up come up with the release process. Matthew, any comments? No, I, I was just going to say about the security process. In the, I mean, every piece of software that gets released will almost certainly have security issues, and you need to deal with them in a responsible manner. Uh, to, to protect both you as a project and your deployed users. So one thing that you should definitely look at having and um, pointing people to um, quickly is a security issue process that outlines sort of how people should deal with a, any particular security concern or issue that they have with your project. Um, so I, 
in the slides, there are links to both uh, Sakai's and CAS's security um, policies. And just typically, uh, you know, I can talk about the Sakai's community. We have a private mailing list where we discuss any reported issues and um, file them effectively in JIRA as a closed issue so that they're only available to the security working group. And then when they become fixed and merged into a stable grant, we make a um, what do you call it? an announcement um, to the general mailing list announcing the availability of fixes in a released version for a set of security issues. And at that point, the security issues are sort of publicly announced. Um, so it's just something, it's much easier if you catch people and get them to sort of follow your workflow before they publicly post to a mailing list saying, I found a particular URL where the authentication doesn't work. Once that's happened, you're then scrambling to try and fix it quickly, release a patch before people might start exploiting it. Whereas if they can first come to you and say, I found something that I think might be an issue, you, you have a bit more time to deal with it. That's not to say that you should take a long time to deal with it. It's important to, just like being responsive with your contributions, being responsive with your security issues and getting them fixed and fixes released quickly. But it's much better to do that when you're not scrabbling against possible people trying to compromise production systems. Excellent. Well, thanks very much. I think we're at the, the designated time for um, questions. Excellent timing, both of you. Thanks a lot. Uh, questions or comments? Anybody want to share their own particular experience or have any direct questions to ask? Now's a good time. I think we can take that silence to mean that you've done a great job. Uh, going twice, any questions? I think Lars has got his hand up. Um, ah. I have a question about, uh, sorry, I hope you can hear me now. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Uh, I do have a question about the rebasing you said earlier, but say basically two questions. and. Uh, First of all, you talked about the size of things, and we found that, uh, so I'm from Opencast, meaning we're doing a lot of things with videos. And we had in the past issues that people added large test videos in the commit, and you will not immediately notice that uh, if you only have a look at the final pull request because they added these a 200 megabyte video file in the commit and then later they notice that and they just did a second commit which would then remove it but that still means it's in the git history uh, so you said uh, rebasing is not a good thing and uh, how would you handle that i mean the two obvious things that come to my mind is either to ask the uh, people to actually rebase it and say, okay, please remove this file from your history for this pull request, or else what you could do is basically squash the uh, pull request when you merge it in, which now at least uh, GitHub is uh, uh, providing as an option. I think Bitbucket, where we are, uh, is doing so too now. Um, I would probably have my favorite of saying uh, rebasing is most of the time a good thing, but uh, how would you approach that? Matthew, okay. you start? Yeah, so in, in Sakai, we tend to just squash all of our PRs into master. So we squash all the commits down and so they get lost. And generally, that's working OK. Um, I think we'll, as more people try and upgrade between versions, we'll find out whether it has more sticking points. Um, it does create, as a developer on Sakai, it does create issues in that I end up with loads of local branches all that I don't know very easily whether they've been merged in. Um, but I think the reason Sakai went down that route rather than asking contributors to rebase, because that's previously what we were doing, 
and for new contributors we would have people getting confused by rebasing and worried about losing work and not having a good experience of um, their first contribution or an early contribution to Sakai. So I think in effect we switch to using GitHub, Squash and Merge just to make contributions nicer and more pleasant for people, is, especially when they're starting out, that's really sort of crucial. Okay, um, then a direct follow-up question to that. Um, if you cryptographically sign your commits, then you would basically lose that as well. Uh, so uh, are you then later, so whenever you merge things in, are you then signing these commits as uh, the review and merge? Uh, master or whatever you want to call it, or do you just throw away these assigned commits and things like that? Yeah, we have, uh, in Sakai we have no signed commits, um, so yes, we throw them away. Um, from a purist point of view, I don't like it. I actually quite like the merging of branches, and I like the fact that if if contributors are competent, that they can make multiple commits. So, for example, I mean, when you're fixing an issue, you might, you might make a test to exhibit the issue, commit the test so that you've got it failing, and then commit the fix separately. So it makes it much easier for somebody else to reproduce those steps if they want to. Um, but I think I still think it's outweighed by the problems that it causes for contributors. You don't have to choose. I mean, it's not a all or nothing um, issue. I mean, you can have advanced contributors rebase their branches and the novice contributors just sort of squash and merge. Um, but yes, that's the route we've gone down in the end. Ms. Sag, do you have a comment on that? I, I was just going to say that I, I could not agree more with Matthew. Um, we, we've we had very horrible, horrible stories from new contributors, you know, describing difficulty with rebasing. And we found that the merge policy or the fast forward merge and, and squashing things down, you know, once GitHub added it, were tremendously easier. And you know, it was it was just something that you didn't have to think about, right? You just you just you just did it and it, it handled it nicely. So that was that was excellent. Um, but in terms of uh, I guess two things I'll add quickly, and that is there's a very nice thread from Linus Torvalds, the guy that runs the Linux project, and I guess the original creator of Git that describes why signing commits is generally not a good idea, but signing tags is. So that's just a tang tangential comment to your, um, uh, to your, uh, well, to your comment, you know, regarding sign, ta sign commits and squashing uh, might actually get them, uh, get them gone. It, you may not actually be losing much according to Linus Torvalds. Uh, on CAS, we don't do sign commits. We sort of keep it optional. If you want to sign your commits, great. If you do not, well then don't. Um, so that, that might actually help you. But in terms of, you know, managing large binary files inside, inside, um, inside the project, uh, in the case of CAS, since we, we've over, over the years have accumulated so much data, I think we've at times went ahead and ran a number of, you know, magical scripts on the repository to shrink it down. And as a result, did something that basically removed those large files that were accidentally added even uh, sometimes without us noticing. And that tremendously helped. But then it also requires that you keep an eye on it, right? You can't accidentally get things go by. Maybe that would be part of your automated um, process to, to vet out uh, pull requests and say, hey, this one, we can't quite accept it because you've added this file that's about 600 megs. I mean, what, is there anything else that we can do here? Uh, so those things you can weed out, but yes, over time you're going to have to do, you know, with with great care and lots of lots of um, you know upfront announcements and schedules advertised to people that yes, we're going to do a little bit of you know history rewriting, rebasing, whatever you want to call it, and we're gonna we're gonna make sure things are condensed. And please be aware that you may lose work. So you know, let's all agree on Friday four o'clock in the afternoon we're going to do this then, and then and then call it a day. So there's a question in chat from Eric Grossman. Could you both comment on tagging before mergers? Matthew, how about you go first? Uh, I don't quite understand the question. So, yeah. Eric, do could you, you amplify in the, in the chat? Or do, you, do you get it, Mr. 
Yes, in the public chat uh, window, there is a question from Eric Crossman. I think that's what you're referring to. Um, that's right. I can I can probably take a stab at this, uh, but if Eric wants to clarify, that would be terrific. So, um, uh, lots of factors here at play. So, typically, I'll I'll speak I'll speak to Kaz when we do releases. Here's what we do: that we say, okay, we're going to release version one point two. We tag the repository at that particular point in time, and we publish that tag to the remote um, reference, essentially the, the canonical repository. And then, and then these tags effectively end up getting marked in GitHub vernacular as releases, which then we use to, to make public and then stuff into them various announcements, change logs, various other things that people may want to, may want to um, know about a particular release, which which is which makes it easier. If you go to the CAS project on GitHub and click on releases, you'll see about 130 something releases, and these are all tags effectively. And these tags have made have been made public, and you can go individually drill down into every single one of them, and then you'll see, you know, here's everything that we know about this particular release. This one's a beta. This one's a release candidate. This one's an official release, and so on. So from that perspective, it works very, very nicely. Again, it's it's a point of advertisement. It's something that you can contribute, um, uh, communicate to your audience about the general health of the project. That yes, this is active. Yes, we are actually doing releases. Go look. You know, there's everything you need to know, so on and so forth. But from a technical perspective, I should say that at least on the CAS project, we've not really found an advantage to tagging, uh, per se, um, and. Uh, you know, it, it, it very much depends, I guess, on how you are instructing your community to download the source code if necessary and where to do it from and how to find a particular version and so on. Are they downloading tags? Are, they, are you producing binaries? And so on and so forth. Um, in general, personally, I do not like tags all that much as I like branches. And I would much rather work on a branch than, you know, have to deal with, with tags. Again, step aside the fact that GitHub does very nicely with tags as far as release management and all that jazz. I hope I hope that answered your comment uh, or question to some degree. Sorry if I was off. We are just about on the hour. Is there anything you'd like to add on that issue, Ma Matthew? Um, no, not really. Uh, the Sakai project uses tags um, in linking because we get quite a lot of reports from users. It's very handy to have sort of tagged releases so that we have a better ballpark of what version they were running against. Um, so, yeah. Well, that's been uh, a really useful hour from my perspective. Thanks for attending. Thanks again to Ms. Egan Matthew for, for presenting. The recording will be available on the Aperio YouTube channel over the next couple of days. And if you've got feedback or suggestions for future topics, please drop me a line. Uh, thanks, everyone, again, and uh, see you shortly.